So we thought it would be a nice idea to invite to the show uh, one of the stars of the original Tron, that groundbreaking movie from 1982. And she also happens to be uh, a co-star in Caddyshack. Mm -hmm, That's right. One of the the ultimate comedy classics uh, that's celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. So, I mean, she's she's in the – she's – uh, integral part of these two classic films that mean so much to so many people around the world. And uh, she has a very interesting story to tell, and she's telling it in a series of three books, uh, the first of which is a uh, is a immaculately collected uh, uh, coffee table volume uh, that she's, uh, she's looking to release in the summer. And uh, then, then she's going to tell us about her other works as well and how she got into the business. This is Cindy Morgan. Enjoy it, guys. Jamie, I, I wanted to become a mechanical engineer, freaked out, mm-hmm. got a little scared, went to northern Illinois, got a degree in English, got rid of my stammer, somehow became a movie star. I said, you got this great big brain. Why don't you make some good use of it? Read the magazines, you know, look like those girls. Well, I dropped a few IQ points in the eyes of other people, but I became an actress. I was yeah. an, uh, an engineer and, and then, uh, you know, got into trial. I'm knowing the whole interview. You want to break in here and ask me questions? <laughs> I, I will, yes. Actually, that's exactly where I was going to start. What was, what was the impetus for you to pursue the path of acting as a career? Uh, well, initially, as I said, I wanted to be, uh, I was accepted to the Illinois Institute of Technology, which is the Midwest kind of version of MIT. And the reason was uh, I wanted a degree in mechanical engineering. My dad had been a plant manager and fled Europe before World War II and went as far as he could with his education, a year and a half of high school. Brilliant man. He had two wonderful skills. Mm. He worked well with people and because he listened. And he also understood how things work. He couldn't be He couldn't be a designer, but he became a test equipment builder. He had remarkable aptitudes. And I wanted to do that for my dad. And uh, then when I went to the open house, it was four guy, four girls and all guys. And I went, Bleh. and I had come from an all-girls Catholic school, 12 years of Catholic school, and the last four were all girls. And I wasn't ready. I hadn't dated. I, and you know, when you see the book, everybody goes, oh, everybody says they're a nerd. Check me out. I mean, look, seriously. I mean, you know, <laughs> it, it, when you see the photos that I have for the first, for the first book, it's a coffee table book, you'll see that. It came from um, the deeper reaches of my psyche who never got a chance to do that. Mm-hmm, and uh, mm-hmm. when I was cornered, this is, I'm talking about Caddyshack now, when I was cornered by the producers because of the fact that I had a background in technology, because I ran camera and sound and was an FCC licensed sound engineer, somebody tried to correct my wiki page and said they don't license sound engineers. And I wanted to say, yeah, have you talked to the FCC? And, and, and were you turning on the tower at the Hancock Center when I was 24? Is that what we had to have? <laughs> I'm not sure my license covered that, but I was doing it. So, mm-hmm. so the reason I got into acting was because I was the radio personality. Even because, even though I had done broadcasting in Rockford, uh, I did the weather very badly. I did the commercials. I did weather in Milwaukee. I, under, I, 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 I was fine and comfortable with camera, but they said, no, no, you're the radio person. You're the tech. And I went, sure. I said, you know, fine. <laughs> and I said, you know, yeah, I was doing morning drive in Chicago. I was running my own board, and I was making $135 a week, and I was pulling numbers. Mm. And um, I was working for the Cadillac record people, the Trash Checker record people. I'm sure you've heard of them. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I went, all right, you know, and um, I um, went out to L.A., and thank God I got an Irish Spring commercial right away that paid my bills. And in eight months, I had Caddyshack. Now, I didn't bother to tell anybody I didn't have any acting experience, but I went into my agent's office and pulled the resumes of the actors I recognized, flipped them over and saw who they were studying with. I went, all right, if I don't learn anything, at least I'll have something to talk about in the auditions. <laughs> so, so how did you know that if, if you had really not given it any kind of thought uh, beforehand or if it wasn't a major goal of yours beforehand Being an act- how, how did yeah how did you know that you could do it or or did you well asking to me asking since i was a little kid there's i come from um my family comes from the rural part of store from holland where storytelling is a lost art 
storytelling, mm-hmm. you know, you know, you go back hundreds of years. Certainly, there were no computers, no, no internet, no, no radio stations, and and, and many people didn't read, you know, the, you know, past the, the, you know, before the 1600s. But storytelling was how how the message came through and and there's something to that and and i and my family comes from a rural part of southern poland where storytelling was still very much alive and 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 you can bring it to life and and it has so many facets you can do it on the radio you can do it you can do it as an actor you can do it as a writer you, you can do it as a speaker and um and and it, and the most important thing is to is to know your story, believe your story, and have passion for it. If you're lying, the audience knows it. From top to bottom on a film set, every every role that people fulfill on a film set, they're all assistant storytellers. Oh, my gosh, yes. The first person I say hello to in the morning is not the director, it's the lighting guy. And mm-hmm. and I'm very I make sure my crew, you know I I, I t- tell my lighting people my crew I'll stand for you as long as you want uh, whatever you need let me know uh, I'm not placating them I, I'm letting them know that I will be there when they need me because mm-hmm. they will they can make or break you right they're right. the ones they're the real unsung heroes uh, I agree I agree and and when you're in front you said that you were comfortable in front of a camera. Sure. When when you got in front of that movie camera f- f- for that first time, uh, was there a learning curve involved? Because you you well, have to be behave in front of a a camera. Sure, sure. Now, now my first experience was in radio. And I had a, I I was when I went to college, you know, and I, and I told you the story. I had a stammer, and I ended up in the speech class. I don't know if it was an elective I chose, or because. They put me there, but but they I was I was in that class. I didn't go to Illinois Institute of Technology. I went to Northern Illinois, mm-hmm. and I was a terrible speaker, but I was a good writer. Mm-hmm. Uh, my first assignment was, I want you to teach us how to make something, and with my unique point of view, I went all right, and I, I stood up and with with a complete cold eye, I said, the assembly and disassembly of your basic squirt gun. And I continued to read. And the audience, the, and I had my nose buried in my script, but they they just cracked up. And the, that was the first time in my life a professor said, come here. And my grades were good, but the professor said, come here. This is what you should do. Major in communications, which at the time was a combination of three things. It was the theory of speech writing, what what, what it is to learn your audience, and learn, find that common denominator, and and tell your story to them. Communication isn't talking. Communication is getting your message across. Oh. All this. The, one of the second parts was broadcasting. I learned to run camera and sound. And the, the the other part was more were speech writing. So so I, I got a good overall view, and I was lucky enough. I, you know, I shouldn't tell this to Northern, but I rarely went to school. I joined the sorority with the best test file on campus and held three jobs, mm. um, two at the student station, camera, and uh, I, I ran the, worked at the television. I'm making tea while I'm talking to you. I hope that's okay. That's fine. I, I uh, ran <laughs> camera, and, and, I, and my first day on radio, and that's what you're asking, my first day on radio, my first day broadcasting, my arms went numb, completely mm. numb, and, 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 but, but I got over it. And went into broadcasting. And then on camera, my first day on camera was the Jerry Lewis Telethon in Rockford, Illinois. I had been doing radio, and I was able to do radio and television in the station. And, and, and they put me on camera. And it was my first day. Here's our new weather girl. Hello, how are you? Cindy's going to take your call. And I picked up the call. And it was a man, you know, purportedly giving a pledge. And his, his exact words were, I'm going to put a cut off your arms and legs, and I'm going to put you out and back in the Albertsons parking lot in the trash can. And I said, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was my oh. Wow. Luckily, we haven't had that many problems. You know, the, 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 the situation, you know, I'm, I, I, 99% of the folks I meet are wonderful, and he was just mm-hmm. trying to be playful. But I take it extremely seriously. I have a strict yeah. no-psycho policy. Somebody misbehaves, red flags go flying, I make a report. There is right. no more... There is no more room for, oh, he had a hard life. So have I. Mm. Knock it off. I, I want to ask you a couple of questions about Please do stop cat- me from talking. I'll give a lecture series and they'll never get a word in No, it. no, that's great. That That is terrific. I, I love hearing you. Uh, but in terms of Caddyshack, 
You're working with, from top to bottom, just a, co- a comedic powerhouse of a cast. Oh, yeah. Uh, did, did that translate into a, a, a fun experience actually shooting the film? Well, let me describe fun to you. Um, you sound like a tech. Am I wrong? I'm, I'm actually not technology minded. Uh, the, are, so minded are you a sports guy or a tech guy? Would you would you would you say? <clears throat> I'm neither. I'm I'm kind of an artist type. Okay. Well, okay. Okay. That's a good. Okay. That is your field. When you are working with other artists, wherever that situation would be, do you ever find yourself in that position when you're? Do you work up to the level of your opponent, and does your art get much better? Oh, it, it, yes. That's as it should All be. All right. Yes. Uh, when you work up to the level of a better opponent, your work gets better. It's a fight to the finish. It's the hardest work you'll ever do in your life. But yeah. it will also be the best work you'll ever do in your life. Mm-hmm. So fun, maybe. I had I had to learn about who I was. They created the character of Lacey by pushing me into a corner, and I came out swinging. I didn't know I had that. I didn't. I wasn't rude. When they sent the photographer from Playboy, I said, and John Peters was saying, he's admitted it, so I don't have to uh, back off from this story. He said, he called me between takes and said, your film will never work again. And I said, so be it, John, but now I'm clear in the set. Because I knew who belonged there, because I run camera. I run sound. And I said, and, and they were hiding everyone. And I said, look, we got a job to do today, and we're burning daylight. So I want to see four men. They had the old, the, they had the old camera, the old cameras. I said, I want to see that focus puller. That director of photography, Harold Ramis, the director, and that actor. Until then, I got all day. Take your time. Hmm. You should have heard the swearing I heard. But I just sat there, and we got the job done. But that was the day Lacey was born. Because the scene, uh, in my mind, was rewritten, Lacey makes love with Danny to Lacey makes love to Danny. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She took charge. She took power. And, 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 um... They did me a favor. I should be sending John a thank you note. Tron. I have to ask about Tron, obviously. Please. The, the, uh, tell me about the – because obviously Tron was a, a major stepping stone in, in terms of the technology of filmmaking and what it's blossomed into today. It was today. the technology of filmmaking. Yeah, but to me, it was I got a script. Now, I knew the language technology mm-hmm. of technology, but these words were new. I had not worked with computers, but I didn't have a problem with that. I did have a problem, however, with lines with Stephen. I would say, now, Stephen, I cannot say, oh, Tron, I knew there wasn't a circuit built that could hold you. All my friends are coming to this movie. (laughs) And Stephen said, you you try to pick a fight with the writer who's also the director. Just try. But um, I'm proud of that line now, and I'll tell you why. Because as, as hard as I tried, I choked on the line. And the, to this day, the audience laughs. And I'm, I'm very fond of that line because I love the audience. You cannot fool them. <laughs> they know. Yeah. They yeah. know. And 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 it's 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 and, and I feel like you know I knew five years ago, and I feel like Tinkerbell. Clap your hands and bring her back to life. Well, they did. But did you feel on Tron? Did you feel that, that it was kind of so new that did you have a sense of you know what, what are we doing? Is this going to work? No, no, I never worry about that. I never worry about that because it always works. It always works because in this case, as I like I said, storytelling is to news reporting is to new writing is to. I knew it would work because I had actors. I could, I could. The, the, you, you've been on sound stages. They're giant warehouses. Mm-hmm. There's, there's nothing there. And in this case, it was a block warehouse. And we were in. But I found the reality in the other actor's eyes. Mm. And if you commit to the scene, it will be there. There will be. I pull a piece of myself. This, this, my, my particular, you know, way of doing this is I won't lie. I, I won't lie because I just, I just, I just can't. I, mm-hmm. I just don't want to. Um, I'll find something in myself that will bring me to that point and, 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 and amplify it and, and make that real. So I wasn't worried about the technology having not been used before. I would do my job to the best of my ability, and it will be real. And, but the only, the only time I raised a question is when um, I came in. I stopped reading the script because I went, this is just, <laughs> I, 
I just just <laughs> tell me what I'm doing today, and and let's. Li- and I did that on Caddy Shack too, but for very different reasons. Um, they were ad living all of that. So so I, I would tell them, all right, what are we doing today? And there was a black riser of sorts, and on top of that was something that looked like a banquet table covered with black felt. And I said. And, and, and Stephen Lesberger said, okay, uh, Morgan, uh, you and Box Lightner on, are on the solo sailor. You're crossing the game sea. Go. Morgan, you're flying the ship. Mm. I said, all right, I just got to ask. What the <laughs> hell are you talking about? <laughs> there's nothing here. I, 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 I got to break in. You know, with all due respect, there's nothing here. And he showed me the beautiful Sydney graphics. He showed me what it would look like. He showed me where it was going so that I could see it in my mind's eye. And I walked up to the banquet table, and I saw where the ship, where the direction was headed. And I looked down in front of me, and I saw the only thing that was real to me, and that was a soundboard. Mm. And he said, whatever you do, the Disney artists will put in. And in my mind, I saw a soundboard that somehow was moving this forward. Let me ask you just uh, so for some brief impressions of some of the great people that you sure. have worked with, uh, starting with Jeff Bridges. Uh, obviously, we've been talking about Jeff Bridges forever. He's always been known as one of our most underrated actors, and he's finally kind of getting sure. the credit that he deserves. He, he's just magnificent. Tell me about that experience. He's a love. He He's passionate about what he does. He believes in what he does. If he doesn't believe in it, he isn't going to do it. Mm-hmm. He's, he, 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 he works hard. He, he comes and prepared, and he... He's just he's just full of passion and life, and 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 I adore Jeff. Can you imagine being in a movie where you get to well, <laughs> I will say imagine you're uh, all right as a guy, you're in a movie and you get to kiss the two most beautiful female leads you've ever seen. How would you be? Mm. Uh, that would be heaven. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was a little yeah. slice of heaven. Mm. You didn't get that take, no problem. I got all day. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, Bill Murray, Bill Murray. Ah, oh, another sweetie, another sweetie. Um, Billy and I didn't have a lot of scenes directly together, but we're both from Chicago, and he saw all the carousing on the set. And and I got to tell you, um, you either became part of the madness or you got washed away. So I I, I was a part of it. Billy <laughs> pulled me on the side one day, and he said, "Look." You know, take it easy. You're not like these guys. Just, just, just easy. Like a big brother put his arm around me. You know, and just, mm-hmm. just, just, you know, Billy is Billy. Those, a lot of those characters are from him. But I have the greatest admir- admi- admiration and 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 the greatest. I mean, these are men I love and will love forever because of who and what they are. The relationship you had with Chevy Chase, I uh, was tr- was strained. I heard, and it's not the first time I've heard that from, from his, his. I would co-star. say strained would be. I, I'd say it would be more accurate to say it was volatile. <laughs> mm. Mm. But 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 it also worked. Yeah. Um, Chevy is a genius. No two ways about it. Um, I was a new kid on the block, and he was going to show me how to run a scene. I was well aware of the fact that when that camera rolls, it's an even playing field. And if you dump a bottle of oil on my back, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to stay right in that scene. For example, that piano playing scene, that wasn't Mm -hmm. in the script. It wasn't rehearsed. It wasn't even discussed ahead of time. Harold Ramis said, come over here and sit down down next to Chevy. I said, why? It's hot. we got stuff to do. You're burning daylight. What's the problem? I mean, I'm, I'm, I come from a broadcast background, not from these guys. And he said, just do it. Just say, sing me a love song. I said, no, I want you to watch my eyes next time you see the scene. You'll see, the, re- the, rec- <laughs> you'll see the recognition sink in. <laughs> you'll see it very clearly. And, and I went, all right, you son of a bitch. I had a big wad of gum in my mouth, and I blew it in his face, and that was the button on the scene. Mm. Wow. But I also will tell you this. Chevy set me up very well when we did our scenes on the porch because he played straight to me. He set me up well. So, so it, was, it, was, it was a love-hate thing, but love and hate are closer than you might realize. And I think yeah. that gave us the passion we needed to do those scenes. It, it, it absolutely did. And, and listening to you talk about your time, uh, you know, your your career, uh, and and the different kind of challenges and opportunities that you've had, 
Um, and, and obviously you're, you're, you're writing these, these books, and so you're yeah. ref- reflecting on what these experiences mean for you. I mean, no, what, I, I'm, well, yes and no. I'll say what they mean for me, but I hope to hit that human common denominator where everybody went to 12 years of Catholic school, everybody had a sister yeah. Francis, everybody had this, and everybody went through in their life a challenge. And from those challenges, you became, well, you either lived or died. Mm-hmm. And let's say you lived. Everybody did the same. And I'm going, to, I'm going to handle these serious subjects directly. I'm going to ded- dedicate the book to Doug Kenny, if you know who he is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, the last line on the first page is, his, I paraphrase the actual expression, and I said, history is written for the victors. Congratulations, Doug Kenny. Your movie's a hit. I guess that's what I'm asking. What what has this journey in, in, in this profession, what has it taught you about yourself? Is it that you are a survivor? Uh, well, you ask me on certain days, and I will disagree with that, but <laughs> it depends on if you're asking my head or my heart. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, the long run is I intend to survive, but all the things that scared me growing up, I'm going to learn about them, and I'm going to go through them. I have 1,700 besides behind-the-scenes images, which I have the rights to for the first book, which will be a coffee table book called From Catholic School to Caddyshack. Mm-hmm. And that one will be based on Caddyshack. That will be followed on the heels of that with some – I'm trying to use the title, Everyone I, nuts, not Everyone I Know is Nuts, a Cindy Morgan story. And, and, and number three is going to be Hat Trick. I went as far as I could as a, as a disc jockey morning drive in Chicago, as far as you can go. Uh, when you don't do things that have nothing to do with your job, I hope you know what I mean, as an actor, you might get held back. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't shoot the nude scene for Playboy. I don't have a problem with Playboy. I have a problem with bullies. Right. And yeah. so, not, so now I get to do what I've always wanted to do, and that's tell stories. And But tell stories, I want to. I, 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 it would be great if I could take the reader and say, come here, take a look at what I saw. You're not going to believe this. You know, mm-hmm. and come on in. Mm-hmm. I mean, in the coffee table book, I was, I'm working with a couple of my friends, and he said, look at that. All the actors are running toward camera. There's a three-story fireball, and now you can see the smoke, and there's one figure there. Who's that looking at the smoke? And I said, that would be me. I apparently am the only actor who's not running trying to get FaceTime on camera. I'm the only one going, am I the only one who saw a three-story fireball? Tomorrow, <laughs> the paint, they're going to paint it green, they're going to blow it up again, and I'm going to be far enough away from these. These guys have got gasoline. I am getting the hell out of here. <laughs> so this is a first-hand account of what it was like doing one of, arguably one of the funniest movies ever made with one of the most brilliant casts. We were struck by comedy lightning. You cannot repeat what was done because you can't plan this kind of improvisation. That mm-hmm. that that's where the movie Magic Eater happens or it doesn't. And then from there, I didn't call for a long. I wasn't called for a long time because I wouldn't shoot the new team for Playboy. My my billing, which was and introducing Cindy Morgan as Lacey Underall, was going to make me the next Bo Derek. That was taken from me, breaking my contract, which was illegal. But nobody stood up for me. My agent, who I called, said, honey, you're not a doe-eyed girl from the Midwest. Handle it. Well, I did, and I came mm-hmm. back and fired him. And and, and, and and sat, cooling my heels at William Morris for the next year and a half, having more lunch with the male agents than auditions. Yeah. Then Disney came calling. This is how it happened. Disney didn't call me to meet with the a, a casting director. Disney didn't call me to meet with anybody. They put me right with the with the director and 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 with Jeff Bridges on tape, and I'm like, okay, I'll go along with this gag. I've seen weird, more unusual situations. I got the job because before Caddyshack, I was in a comedy improv class and dating an actor who took me to lunch where he had a job in a cartoon, and I was listening and I'm like, okay, cartoon sounds like fun, but I was eating my lunch. Well, that was Tron. You have a lot of terrific fan interaction. Tell me about their their enthusiasm and, and, and your encounters oh, with them. Ninety nine percent is a just. A, I mean, it, 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 I'm I'm exhausted at the end of the day because I hear the most wonderful stories about 
And I can tell you, I, I, I can tell you, I, I'm nine out of 99% right. I can see a fan coming and I can tell you Caddyshack or Tron. In fact, I keep my Caddyshack pictures on one end of the table and my Tron pictures on the other end just to keep the peace. You know, <laughs> because <laughs> this is the first year because of the crossover, because of Caddyshack's 30th anniversary mm-hmm. and because of tr- the Tron legacy, um, uh, the fans have been so warm and wonderful, and it's almost a gift that, you know, it would have been nice to have the part in the film. I really could use the money. There isn't much we get because, you know, we don't get money from the DVDs. Mm-hmm. We don't get money from anything that was included in the cable, what wasn't included in the original contract. So very little comes from that. But yeah. uh, you know, yeah, but 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 what we do get, but but so so that would have been nice. But can I tell you how much cooler it is? I mean, could you imagine somebody coming up to you and saying, "I heard a podcast you did 30 years ago, and it affected my life so that it changed everything." The Caddyshack fans, it's a lifestyle. The mm-hmm. Trump fans, it's more of a, tr- it's more of a spiritual. Uh, hmm. Attraction. It's a very different um, um, mindset, but but the, the, they say the most wonderful things and the coolest thing has happened because of the internet. The fans have a voice. Yes. Because of the internet, the fans are making the decisions. And when I heard the support come, such a I, I can't tell you what it feels like to have somebody say that meant something to me. 